I want to read for you uh, from the book of James, chapter 1, verse 19 and following. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was preparing for this message, I was thinking about what stories I've experienced around listening. And I can't help myself. My favorite story about listening happened in Milwaukee. My wife and I were uh, at a fast food restaurant. We were sitting there having a meal. And at some point, we both realized that neither of us were talking because we were both listening in on the same conversation. And so just a couple tables over to us, uh, there was a middle-aged man and two 20-something uh, young ladies. And through this conversation, it became obvious that these two young ladies were Mormon. And this man was asking about the Mormon faith. And he had a specific question. And he asked these two young ladies, so can I have more than one wife? And these two young ladies are kind of awkwardly like, well, well, you know, the Mormon church hasn't taught that for a very long, long, long time. That's not what we believe. They go on this whole thing. They talk about their faith. And a little while later, the man goes, so, but like, can you have more than one wife? And you're like, man, this is an awkward conversation. Uh, it's already just awkward because I'm sure these two young ladies are like, oh no, like this is like, I was preparing for one faith conversation. I was not preparing for this guy who's just trying to find out if he can have a bunch of wives. And he's not listening to us. How do we, like, I already answered this. Do I have to repeat everything that I just said? And we felt like the secondhand kind of embarrassment and awkwardness. And, and Beth and I are just looking at each other like, what is going on over there? But the reason that it was awkward is because this guy was not listening. It'd be one thing if you had a serious question, it might feel like it's in left field and this is not the question you should be asking, but the problem isn't necessarily the first question. The problem is when you do not hear the person in front of you who answers you and you're like, okay, I hear what you said, but what I want the answer to be has not been said out loud yet. So maybe I should ask it again. And you think maybe if I keep asking and as a parent having kids at home, I know the, like the whole game of, well, how many times do I ask? Maybe you'll change your answer. Or maybe if I switch parents, I'll get a different answer. Uh, Cause we're not actually listening for the answer. We're just trying to get what we want out of the conversation. We're trying to hear what we want. And the problem is, is that we live in a society that does not listen. We can't hear each other. We keep talking at each other. We keep yelling over each other. We, we, we live in a world that it's just getting louder and louder. Uh, you know, it's easy to see it in the political space where the talk shows that are getting more angry and more frustrated and, and you don't just debate, you criticize in the way of like, I want to attack people's character. I don't want to talk about the ideas. I want to cut people down. Uh, I, I grieve this. We're about to be in a March Madness time. I think about sports news. If you're not used to um, sports news, it used to be ESPN was filled with a bunch of like commentary and, and people who'd analyze sports. And then it became, well, what talking heads can talk the loudest? Which ones can give the hottest takes that are going to like rile you up? And it just becomes shouting and becomes a caricature. But it's because we, we just don't know how to listen to each other. We just want to get our opinion across. We don't really want to hear your opinion. I only want the books on the shelves that I like. I don't want the books that you like. 
because we don't want to listen. And I think that there's something really important about this text that we read today, which is James wrote at a time that the world was not in harmony. Imagine that. He lived in a divided time. If you can imagine, uh, we don't know what it's like to be a complete religious minority. They, they live in a time where the Roman Empire was not positive towards Christianity. And he writes to the 12 tribes in the diaspora, the, the scattered uh, people of God. And we don't always feel scattered. We feel like we've got power, we've got prominence, but, but they live in a scattered world that lives underneath an, another empire. And you have to know how to survive and interact and how to learn from each other, how to talk, how do we, how do we navigate this world? I mean, these early Christians, they took the gospel into all these different places. They had to understand the desires, the needs, the problems of all kinds of people. And so he writes to the scattered people who are in conflict. He talks about trials and persecutions, but it's not just from Rome. They're brothers and sisters in the faith. They're Jewish brothers and sisters. They can't get along. And, and well, how do I understand who Christ is? And there's fighting within their own, um, you know, he talks to the 12 tribes, the God's people, why is God's people falling apart? Why are they, why are they in, at odds with each other? And so he lived in a divisive time where people couldn't quite get along themselves. And in the midst of that, he doesn't just say, talk louder, shout a little bit louder at your neighbor. He has a different message. I'm going to read this again for us, a couple of verses. In James 1, verse 19 and 20, he says, you must understand this, my beloved. And I like this. He's just trying to like, hey, sit down. I want you to hear me. Uh, and I don't want you to just let this rush by. You need to hear this. And I need to prompt you. Hey, understand this, beloved. I love you, but I need to talk to you about something. You need to hear this. Let everyone be quick to listen. I don't think that's our natural inclination is to rush to listening. Oftentimes we're rushing to what's the next thing I need to say or, or, or what's the next thing I need to go do. But when someone is talking to you of like, I want to jump at listening. I want to jump at understanding what you're saying. I want to hear you. Not, well, you know, what, what's my to-do list? What do I have to go do later? What? Uh, what's my notification on my phone? Uh, we have all sorts of other things that are competing for us, but be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. I think some people, this comes easier than others. We have different struggles. If you're very extroverted, you might love to get to talk. And this text is a very challenging one, which is listen for a little bit. You don't have to jump into talking. You can just rest and listening. Now, you might be someone who's not very talkative and you're like, I feel like I've got this figured out. I am slow to speak. The next one, be slow to anger. I think it invites all of us into some challenge. In a world that is divisive and is, is angry, how do we not also get caught up in that anger? And so everybody sit down. My beloved, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And then we get this interesting phrase that is ambiguous and a little bit challenging to understand. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. That might sound simple, but if you try to actually understand what's going on, your anger does not uh, produce God's righteousness. There's a few possibilities of what to do with that. Uh, maybe it's because... God does not indulge in anger. And so if we want to be like God and we want to be like God's righteous way of living, well, you don't get there through anger. Anger is not the mode to be like God. Uh, and that's pretty, that's easy enough to understand. Okay, I don't think God is just like a wrathful, angry God. Uh, and if I want to be like God, I can't be angry and vengeful myself. There's another version of how you can take this statement. For human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Maybe it means that if we do indulge in our anger, God withholds some level of righteousness. God withholds some sort of uh, healing power in us that, that maybe when we use our anger, it's like a, an obstacle that God says, uh, let's hold off. I don't want to puff up. I don't want to platform your angry self. 
turn back to me. For human anger does not produce God's righteousness. There's another way to read that. And I think this is an interesting way. It says, perhaps, um, you know, the word righteousness in the Bible, so in the New Testament, the word righteousness also means justice. It's the same word. Translators have to decide which they want to translate. And it's weird for us because righteousness feels very different than justice. But it's all caught up in the way that you should be in the world, the way that things should be, whether that feels internal or feels external. But maybe if I'm angry, I think God should be angry. And so maybe I think God should bring God's justice on those who I'm angry with. And so I'm going to be so angry that I, I'm in this divine, I, you know, I've got this righteous anger that of course God is going to judge you. God's going to hate this thing. God's going to bring God's wrath on that thing. But maybe, just maybe, your human anger does not produce God's righteous judgment and justice. Maybe God's not ready to zap the people you're ready to zap. Maybe, just maybe, our righteous anger isn't all that righteous. I think we hide behind that. We don't hear some people because we feel with righteous indignation, I know what is right and good, and you are not on that path. Your idea, your way of living is definitely not righteous. God's going to judge you. And then how are you going to hear anybody when you already have decided that the God of the universe already has said no to this person? what listening is going to happen? You know, if you think someone's going to hell and, and then there's just no chance you're ever going to just listen, right? So like we think we know God's justice and God's righteousness and then we turn off our ears and we don't listen anymore. But if we want to listen, if we want to be slow to speak and we want to listen, quick to listen, we have to sometimes remove the earplugs that are blocking our ability to listen. So James tells us, rid yourselves of all sordidness. What an interesting word. And rank growth. And the translators are like, okay, I got to get you something that gets at how ugly of a thing this is. Rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has power to save your souls. I think all of this kind of ugly language of spiritual like decay that's growing in us uh, it, it feels like it's some sort of spiritual cancer at work in our system. And I know that you know, we face the challenges of our physical health and deterioration, but sometimes there's some spiritual unhealth that when you let it grow, it festers. It gets bigger and bigger. And one of the things it does is it makes it hard to listen. Because as you start to get more angry or more prideful or more judging or all of those things, suddenly it starts taking over. And so James calls us to, we got to take care of the spiritual growths that are unhealthy, that are blocking our ability to hear. And so some of us, we might recognize that when we have this thing growing in us, that somehow we stop hearing from God. We just don't listen. We feel just the silence. And so maybe we need to be intentionally trying to figure out what in my body, what in my soul, what in my spirit do I need to let go of? What needs healing? And what do you just rest in that? For me, one of the things that I, I've loved the most in prayer life as I've gotten older is, is just having time of silence. Not having to talk about things, not having to say a bunch of things, but being quick, quick to listen to God. Just, God, what do you have to say? I'm going to try my best to be quiet. And you could do five minutes, you could do 10 minutes, you could do 30 minutes, you can do whatever you want, but just turning off all distractions, just listening and resting and saying, God, what needs healing in me? What needs healing? And it's not just that we can't listen to God. We also struggle to listen to each other. How are we creating intentional spaces where we, we want to hear from each other? Um, maybe that's turning off the phone and saying, okay, I'm here with you. I'm not somewhere else. What do you got to say? One of the things that I've loved in our own community is the, one of the benefits and one of the reasons for our cafe on Wednesday nights is that we said that it matters that there's a space for people to be able to talk. 
It's not just about like having a fast food and just like, oh, I got my food and, and it's great to get food. If you're hungry, food matters. But beyond that, what is it to have a space where at least just you and a server can interact a little bit? Maybe you might have friends, maybe you might have family and just coming and sitting and talking for a little while, that that matters, that there's some meaning and importance to just being able to talk. And for some of us, we, we, we don't listen to God, we don't listen to each other, but we also don't listen to ourselves. That maybe my body's telling me I'm a little too stressed. My anxiety, my stresses are pulling me so tight and thin. I just, I gotta listen to my body. Like, what's going on with me right now? And so maybe we need to journal. Maybe we need to pray more. Maybe we need to go to therapy. Maybe we need to listen to our bodies. We need to do something and say, okay, I'm not listening hands, feet, heart. What do I need to hear today? And I think it's important that we learn that listening is about more than just hearing and understanding. Listen is about, listening is about doing too. You know, there's a lot of psychology around active listening right now, where we talk about um, how do we engage people? How do we not get distracted? How do we um, res- not try to just respond? But we're trying to understand how do we stop judging people so we can listen? But active listening in psychology is about understanding. Like, do I, do I understand what's being told to me? And that's a really important first step. But James takes this further and he says, be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. Uh, I love that he's pushing us that it's not just enough to hear and understand someone, but that should probably change something in us. If we hear someone truly, how are you going to live differently? How are you going to respond? How are you going to do something in the world that I I don't want to have, you know, someone telling me about their pains, their, their traumas, their, their problems, and, and just say, okay, well, that's just how the world is. At least I know their pain now, but I don't want to help make this world better where this pain doesn't emerge as much. And so James tells us, for if anyone is hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. They look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they look like. And that's a really weird image. Um, One, I'm not used to thinking about first century people looking in the mirror. Uh, We're used to us like with our selfies and, okay, how do I look on camera? Um, But even then, people are looking in mirrors. Okay, this this is a human response. I want to know how I look. But James is saying, hey, it would be weird though if you looked at the mirror and you saw some problem and you didn't do anything. You just forgot about it the next minute. Like let's say you went out to a a work lunch or you went on a date or you went somewhere where your appearance matters to you and you saw you had a big piece of lettuce stuck in your teeth and then you turned around and completely went eh and walked off, forgot all about it. It's like who does that? Like you look in the mirror and you respond to it. You you learn something about yourself. You should change. You should, you should move with what you've seen. So what's the point of having a reflection if you don't live out of it and you don't do something about it? And so James calls us to living out, looking into God's perfect law, the law of liberty and persevering, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Now, the obvious place of respond, do something with what you've heard, is the instruction from God. This is the big context of the story. When God says something to you, don't say, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense, God, thanks. But, well, now what? Go do something. If God has shown the, re- the mere reflection to you and you've cer- learned something about yourself or about the world or about God, what are you going to go do with that? Don't just hear it and then ignore it and then move on. And I think James is famous for people know that James says something about faith without works is dead. And he calls us to, well, what if you trust God, but you don't do anything with it? And I love that this story here is listening without works is dead. You haven't actually listened if there's no change, there's no response, there's no action. And so what is it to hear a gospel of freedom? That God says you are free from being slaves to sin, from, from being... Um, divided a society. If you hear this great good news and your life hasn't changed, what's going on? If God says you are made in my image, 
You're not meant to be looked down upon. You are not less than those who have more power and money in your society. All people are equal. Yes, men and women. Yes, Jews and Gentiles. Yes, slaves and free. All are equal. If you then hear that message and then you don't do anything different, you did not hear the message. So when I go into those church communities in those first centuries and the slaves are still being thought of as less than and being mistreated and and the, the people with money are still eating communion before there's any food left, you know, before the other people get off of work because they're working late hours. And, and you get people like Paul saying, hey, save some food. Don't eat it all. Just because you don't have to work, that just doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't need food. Or what is it for people to keep telling uh, the woman in the story that Jesus shows up to Mary Magdalene, go tell the disciples that I'm, I've been raised and the men are like, you know, I, I need to see it for myself. I'm not going to hear your testimony. And there's a lot of men throughout these centuries who have not listened to a lot of women's testimony. What's the point of saying we're free, that male and female, it doesn't matter. Slave and free, it doesn't matter. No category matters. All that matters is who God made us all into being. We are all in God's image, loved, redeemed, renewed. If you hear that and you don't do anything with it, you didn't hear it. And I know we still live in a society where it's hard to find the great diversity of God's kingdom in worship together. It's, it's hard to find it in life together, of like living out that great, beautiful calling. And that's one of the things I've loved with our cafe is that you have a room full of people who have very different perspectives, different backgrounds, different experiences. And we say, God is at work in the midst of all of these people. What great stories have I not heard? What great stories are there to learn? And I have a story to share too, but I, I can't just always be the one sharing all the time. I got to hear, I got to listen to what God is doing in their lives too. So James tells us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And he tells us that our spirituality is worthless if we don't respond. You might try to check every box, but it doesn't matter if there's not any level of response. I want to read James 1, 26 and 27 again. If any think that they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. There's a lot of people who... Uh, their social media feed, their text messaging, their everyday conversation betrays their faith. We have not bridled our tongues very well. What is it to be called to a way of love, loving our neighbors, loving our enemies? Does our tongue reflect that kind of love? We deceive ourselves sometimes thinking, well, you know, if I went to church, I went to church on Daylight Saving Sunday. Surely that's enough, God, right? I don't actually have to talk different, do I? I don't have to listen, do I? Because I checked that box. And I know a lot of other people did not check that box. That must mean I'm on the good side, right? But what is this worth if my tongue has not been tamed in some level? And we all know the moments when you've been angry and you've shouted something at somebody, you've said the thing that just has cut somebody down when you were supposed to build them up. We all have work to do with our speech, with our listening. And so can we be hearers of the word and doers of the word and not just take faith on our religiosity? And so... What has value? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. God says, okay, I want you to look at the people who are not listened to, who are overlooked, who don't have as strong of a voice, as loud of a voice in society, so orphans, widows, the stranger in your midst, how well are you caring for them? Because that shows how deep 
your, your love for God is at work and how well you are living out this calling, this new life. And so who needs to be heard? Who needs to be seen? Who needs to be loved and cared for? And so how well are we living out what God calls us into? I think a lot of people have a frustration that they're like, well, if Christianity was anything like Jesus, I would be all for it. Because the, the complaint is that, well, I just don't know Christians who live that way. I don't, know, I don't know a church that actually lives this out. What if we said, okay, I want to read my Bible and I want to hear from God. I don't want to hear myself. I want to hear something from God. Please, God, talk to me. Tell me where there's spiritual unhealth that I need to heal. Tell me where I need to go. Tell me what I need to go do. God, let me be transformed. Not just let me think the right things. But how do I hear the people around me? And so my encouragement today is that we might not be like that person on that McDonald's dining room where we were like, I am dead set on one thing. Not also recognizing the unhealth of the one thing that I'm dead set on. God, God, I, I need this thing. Please, just this thing, just this thing. Maybe being a little more receptive. God, I think this is what I need in life, but also show me if I'm just completely out of, out of bounds here. Like that, this is not actually what I need, then please, Take another path. But, but God, I need something. Please tell me what's wisdom look like for my situation. Are we willing to look ourselves in the mirror? There's one side of that, of looking in the mirror and saying, you know what? I've got that spiritual mole that looks like it needs to be checked out. You know, that, that doesn't look quite right, right? Like, I, I think I need to examine this a little bit more. And... I think we all have places. I know that we could easily say there's a lot of, of people, there's a lot of Christians who really need to look in the mirror. But the truth is, is we all need to look in the mirror. Lord, point out those places I still need healing. But there's something else about looking in the mirror because you are made in the image of God. There might just be something hopeful in looking in the mirror. You might realize God's goodness by looking in the mirror. You might see who God made you, who you can be by looking in the mirror. And so we look to the mirror, not just to see where there's unhealth, but to see where God's goodness and blessings might reign more, more pronounced in the world. So are we willing to look in the mirror? And my biggest hope, would we do something with that? It's not just enough to look in the mirror to see yourself as you are and as you could be, but go live that. If you want to be more patient, it's a tough thing to ask for because you're going to have to be patient. God, I need the fruit of patience to grow in me. Go live it out. Go find a place to go be patient. Go practice. If you want to be more kind, think about how your words are, are being heard by people. Practice kindness. Sometimes we feel like, well, I don't know, is this too worksy? This book of James, you know, it's talking about all the doing stuff. You know, does, does the doing stuff matter? How do we love God and love neighbor without doing something about it? It's just a natural effect of if you tell someone you love them, it should affect the way we live. And so may we be willing to look in the mirror. May we be willing to act, to live out this great calling. May we be blessed. May we find life and extend that to others. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we ask that no matter what words have been said today, no matter what music we've played, no matter what prayers have been offered, that beyond all things that we have heard from you today, keep our ears tuned for you. Lord, we ask for the courage to look in the mirror, to see the places that still need healing, to see the goodness that we don't 
often see in ourselves, to see how you see. May we find encouragement and energy to follow you, to to follow you out into the world, to trust that you've been at work in other people's lives in ways that we don't know yet, to be curious, to be curious to find out people's stories and your story. Lord, we ask that we might not neglect the cries of the oppressed, the cries of those in need, that we might hear those things and and minister into those spaces. Lord, we ask that you might calm our spirits, our anxieties, our stresses, our distractions, so we might hear afresh today. So in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.